Hi guys and welcome to another episode of the Flip the Mindset podcast. I know the world is upside down just now, but I hope my podcast will bring some hope, some well needed motivation and inspiration to those who need it. I want to introduce our first long term sponsor. Silver Lining Debt Relief help people break free from debt. Silver Lining are specialists in government backed debt solutions that can vastly reduce monthly payments, freeze interest and write off unaffordable debt. Debt is not only defaults and letters, it is also a lot of your income going out to pay creditors, stress, worry and missing out on making memories with your family. By facing debt rather than avoiding it, you will have less to worry about, security, more money each month and a better financial future free from the misery of debt. We are here to help people find a manageable, legally binding solution to get out of debt. You can check out our debt calculator on our website to quickly discover if you qualify for help at www.sldr.uk. Alternatively, you can email sldr at info at sldr.uk or you can call them on 0141 473 5200. It's not a weakness accessing help. Take the right steps to manage your day. Now, on to the podcast. Hello guys and welcome to another episode of the Flip the Mindset podcast. This is episode 10, we're flying and today we've got a very special guest, Ryan Stevenson. Uh, you've probably seen him on the TVs with uh, the long jacket thing that's going about. <laughs> that's made me famous. Ryan's been a, a footballer that's been all about Scotland. He was at Chelsea as a young boy. He's played for teams as Partick Thistle, Hearts, Air United and Ipswich. Um, and he was a real talent, someone who I always watched growing up as a striker. Um, well, he actually wasn't a striker, got put into the striker. So um, how are you? Yeah, good, mate. Good. Can I complain? How's lockdown been? Um, first one was actually okay. Enjoyed it. Enjoyed um enjoyed the sunshine enjoyed the break sort of enjoyed the kind of reset of uh taking the time to just spend time at the house with the family and things like that uh-huh. i think um this last lockdown uh, i found incredibly difficult to be honest I, th- I thought that i think everybody has it sort of prolonged and went on and on and on so yeah this lockdown has been has been tough for me new baby that's old. probably why he's been probably, tough. probably. <laughs> see i had a to relate back i had a baby in the first lockdown yeah january and then we heard it and then obviously we were need eating lockdown as i've said before but um with the anxiety that even even though having a baby is an amazing thing yep. the anxiety of having a baby is enough for a for a dad yeah and a mum but through that second lockdown um where you're not feeling like you're getting out anytime soon and we're all a wee bit down how was that anxiety of, for you um it was fine for me to be fair i'm, I'm um I'm quite happy go lucky. I don't really stress about or I try not to stress about much now. Um for Sarah it was I think it was a lot more difficult because uh, she's used to working hundred miles an hour. Then she falls pregnant, she has to stop obviously because of the lockdown. She then can't really go out and socialise with her pals, go for a coffee, go for lunch and like that. So she kind of would dealt with it all on her own. Um, which she'd done amazing and she still is doing amazing. But again, even with the wee one being here. She still can't go out and do anything with her pals. She can't go for a coffee. She can't take the wean out. The wean's never been out for lunch. Yeah. Um. So I think she had uh, kind of ups and downs through it, which is understandable. Um. And I just had to try and support her. But for me personally, uh, I enjoyed it. I, I was, you know, I was obviously the both of us were delighted. But I get the easy part. She's she's got the hard part grow, <laughs> growing the baby. Uh, I having had, the I baby and having the baby. I had the easy part. So I did. Wow. I had mental and mental. <laughs> Wow, she's like that. You're not coming to another one with me. <laughs> it's, a, it's some it's some experience. I think um, I think until you actually do it and you're part of it, mm. it's uh, you, you can't really you know, explain to me. She actually gave me the heart attack of my life. She had the baby right, and then we're sitting for a few hours, and then she needed to go to the toilet, and she got up and just collapsed. And she's doing this kind of movie thing, like if something's happening. I think it's when you faint. Sometimes you can do this wee movie thing like that in a form. I thought ah, she scary, isn't it? I'm telling you, man. It's I thought she thing. was going. I'm like, I'm going to be left with it myself, we and I was to, crapping uh, myself. Say they had a section, so we, we had been in, and I just, I don't like that sort of thing. It's just not my bag. 
<laughs> and uh, they had obviously the nurse had come out and brung, brung us in and she's lying on the, the operating table ready to go happy as Larry just sitting there are you okay and, that, and everybody was asking me if I was alright yeah. the nurses sort of came over to me and I was sort of chattering away chattering away because you're worried obviously you're worried about Sarah you're worried about the baby and uh, the nurse said listen Ryan if, if you faint we're just leaving you on the floor because I was genuinely like <laughs> crumb, <laughs> crumbling away so um I, listen, I made it all about me, as I do. Uh, yeah, so you, you can't, you, the only thing you're, like, for me, do you know when they're about, they're pushing? Yeah. And they start involuntary pushing, right? Do you know the heartbeat keeps dropping on yep. the screen and the doctors and nurses keep looking at it? Arts kept going below 40. Yeah. And I'm like that to the nurse. Well, I've already studied it on YouTube, you know what I mean? As you know, you, you looked before Aye. it. And um, it, I've, I've said to the nurse, and I've said, the midwife, sorry, and I've says, is that supposed to be, if we don't like it going, going for it, blah, 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 and it kept dipping low, and I'm, I'm crap Because you're powerless, mate, that's a problem, because well, you're powerless to the full situation. What happened then is, right, what happened then is, she's, Steph wasn't going for it properly, do you know? She was, maybe not, she was, maybe shocked by the moment, Yeah. so I started shouting at her, I'm telling you, I'm like that, Steph, <laughs> push! <laughs> Push! There's no messing about here. You need to push. I'm going nuts, honestly. And you, you should never forget this. I wish we had it on video camera. So I'm like a motivational guy, and everyone knows me. It's like, push now. You know what I mean? We need to get this baby out. And I'm being brutal, and then she just turns on, man. She just. Ah, Aye, something kicks in on them, mate. Something kicks in. I think something kicks in nah, mother's instinct. It's, and it's just mental. Boom. Yep. And then I, I was so. I, I've never been so proud of my life, yep. you know? But <laughs> moving on for the baby talk. Someone, someone's going to be ex- some people will be watching this expecting a baby they? Like, oh, God. Oh, oh no crap, man. <laughs> I'm not going <laughs> I'm working that day three positions yep. midfield striker and goalkeeper <laughs> yeah. what's that Partick isn't it Partick and Wraith Rovers so oh, twice. I, oh twice twice as a goalkeeper mate, I, I, almost, I think it was a Partick one I see, did you save the penalty not on you I should have saved it but I never and then I actually got dogs abuse for the fans behind because I never saved it mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and uh, yeah, when I'm obviously I probably should have saved that and then I done a, I had a full game in goals for Wraith Rovers against the United. How did that come about? The uh, three of the three of the goalkeepers had got injured. I think that the the manager at the time they had inquired to the SFA they could bring in another goalkeeper. They said no. Um we had a meeting a couple of days before they tried to get the game cancelled. They said the game wasn't going to get cancelled. And we had a meeting and he just said, look. Does MD stand up? I, I was one of the older ones in the team and I thought it's only right that I take take a bit of responsibility and, mm-hmm. and I've, I've went in goals for 20 minutes against Partick Thistle. Eh, against Hart, sorry, for Partick Thistle and thought, listen, what's the worst that can happen? You get beat 9-0, you get beat 9-0. Right. Um, and I said, right, I'll do it. And that was it. Cammy <laughs> Bell, who was at Rangers at the time, sent me his gloves. Got his gloves sent over uh, and then went and, went and played in the game. And to be fair, the actual game turned out we only got beat one 0 but it was pretty much the end of my career because I just I, at the end I, I remember standing at there was one stage in the second half where I was just stood and I was like, I come for here, I play, for, I played for here, I love a United, mm-hmm. and I'm standing in goals, and it was like a massive big joke, and I was just stood there and I was like, if there was anywhere else in the planet that I could be, mm-hmm. I wouldn't be here. That's interesting. Um, and that was that pretty much. I wasn't long after that that I chucked it. Do you think that summed up the time of year? Um, I, I, it was just a difficult time. So it was, it was a difficult time for me personally. Um, and I wasn't enjoying football at all. And then I still felt as if I probably wasn't mentally in the right state to even think about going in goal. Because if I'm an outfield player to go in goal, it's quite a big thing. <laughs> and again, you look at it and you say, if you get beat 9-0, uh-huh. what's, what's the worst that can happen? Like that, that That's expected. But you, you, I'd be the laughing stalker, yeah. and I didn't want to go out being yeah. the laughing stalker. I, I had a semi decent career, um, but it was uh, it was a lonely, lonely night. So it was it was a hor- it was a horrible, horrible experience. Okay, right. What's it like to play at your um, boyhood club? So you signed for the United. Home Coyle says they don't want to lose you. Um, Firstly, I want to know, what's it like playing at your boyhood club? Do you feel there's any added pressure? Sometimes we see it going both ways with Shane Duffy at Celtic. It went, it was a negative experience for him. It is a negative experience for him. Um, and you see other 
boys who will become the the hero of their city yeah. or the hero of their their town. Um, first of all, you know, what's do you feel as if there's any added pressure and um, could you see how good Own Coyle was going to do at the time as a manager? What did you think of him um, professionally and personally? Amazing man, values uh, <laughs> the way he went about his business. The way he was just as a man, I still see him just now. I still call him Gaffer when I see him. <laughs> um, and he was just, he was a tremendous player. That was his, his first manager job. Um, when I had him at St Johnston, he was amazing for me. But again, he was honest with me. I was playing in a position that I didn't want to play in. He wanted me to play there. Um, and I asked if I could go out on loan. He was reluctant to let me go. But let me go, I went to air. And I, th- I just thought, I'm going to go here. It's a chance to try and make a name for myself. I've, I've supported there. My family support here. Um, I'll use it as a stepping stone. And again, at 22, 23, you're, you're pretty much bulletproof with everything you do. I don't think that I gave it much thought. Um, when I went back for my second spell, because I had done so well in my first spell, at Ayr, going back for my second spell, now I had went on and had a decent career. And I was going down the way at that stage. So... Mm-hmm. I should have been able to handle it a lot better and another. Um my second spell was, was pretty difficult, so it was. Um but I embraced it, I enjoyed it, I loved it. I loved everything about the club, I loved playing for the club. Um a lot I learned a hell of a lot. I, I was from twelve year old I'd went to Chelsea and all I had ever known was the bright lights so of football. It was Aye. fast cars loads of money, you know, you're, you're 12, 13 year old and you're seeing these players playing for Chelsea earning tens of thousands of pounds a week. You fast forward that to I was 21, 22 when I, when I first went to air and they were part time and they had boys on 50 pound a week mm-hmm. on a building site on a Monday and a Wednesday night coming to training, covered in muck, putting their training kit on, going out in the rain and training because they loved football. Mm-hmm. And then, um, that sort of gave me the values of one I had probably lived in a a bubble in a world football wise that wasn't real. Two, when I went to it, it gave me values of if I don't buckle down and I don't do things properly, I could find myself very quickly having to go and get a job and having to do things that I don't particularly want to do because I wanted to be a footballer. Yep. So I signed for I signed for three years. I went on an initial four week loan. Air bought me. And I signed for three years there and I gave myself a two year window to my last year of my contract that I was going to do everything that I possibly could every single day to try and get a move. Mm-hmm. And luckily enough, I played just over two years there and I moved on to Hearts. Hearts, Hearts bought me in the, the January transfer window. Scored some goals at Hearts. Yeah. Hell yeah. yeah it was, against Old Firm. Yeah. It was, um, no, it was an amazing time again. It was a, it was a, I went there and I signed and you realise the enormity of how big the club is and um, the pressure that you're going to be under playing for a club that size. Um, it was another step on, obviously, for United. There was pressure at air because I knew everybody around the club I stayed in here. So you had that pressure of living where you played. Mm-hmm. Um, but then, obviously, you move on to a, a club like Hearts and you've got 20,000 at your games every week. You're expected to win against Rangers and Celtic. They expect you to win. And uh, again, I just embraced it. I enjoyed, enjoyed every moment of it. Um, there was a lot of highs. There was a lot of lows. That's sport in general. Um, but I, I loved, I, again, I had two spells there, obviously, with my, with going to switch in between it. But the two spells that I had there were, were amazing. I think, it's, I like what you said there at the start about the different types of pressure. Like, um, you've got the pressure cooker at Chelsea, and obviously you've got the, the you're under the, sh- the show lights and that. But when you go here, you've got the you've got the, the real the, life, the financial pressure, yeah. and uh, people think these um, first, second, and third division players are on ridiculous wages. When you know you're talking about even boys in the in the lower half of the Scottish Premiership not getting paid that much money and, and having a second job or a night time job these yeah. days, and um, it's not sometimes what it's what it's made out to be, but people view it as these guys are all it's the superstars, biggest, they're open to abuse, this and that. It's the biggest pitfall, mate. Aye. The biggest, the biggest, pit, the biggest pitfall was, and I was, I definitely fell into that at a stage where people look at you and think you earn loads of money, mm-hmm. 
um, you're going to be set for life. And you kind of end up starting to believe that mm -hmm. because that's what everybody believes. You're a football player, you're living the dream. Yeah. But there's a lot more to it. You know, there's a lot, a lot in the back end of it which people don't see. Yep. Um, which I swept under the carpet for a very long time. So I did. I swept under the carpet for 24, 25. Now I earned, I earned decent enough money yeah. to, to have a nice lifestyle and a nice life. But I never earned enough money that I was going to be able to retire. And um, I always just kind of, I'll deal with that another day, I'll deal with that another day, which I should have done and was prepared, which I never. And um, 30, 31, it hit me like a ton of bricks. Do you think um, this affects young players' mindset? So imagine, well, I played one year professionally, um, earning a couple of hundred pounds a week. Um, and I fell into a trap for four months of going out to carbon. Yeah, and get out to Sugar Cube. Yeah, and thinking I was a baller, and I'm saying like, I borrowed hundred quid off my ma. Yeah, you know what I mean, and maybe got my wages in yep. from working in a, a clothes shop, and I'm out there, and just because people assume that you play, it doesn't matter who you play for, does it? As a footballer, no, I mean, people just assume, right? And you're out there, you're buying bottles with your mates, and all that. it's not sustainable, but it can be lived, and it um, can be a big facade, and I see many players getting caught with your your your. Um, getting caught into this yep. um, and do you think that has a effect on our young boys mindsets in Scotland? 100% mate 100% I think it's a, I think it, I think it's effect on every young kid that's playing's mindset Let, let's not get away from it there's no better feeling than when you're out in a nightclub but you're a young kid 18, yeah. 19 year old you're <laughs> playing football you're getting attention everybody loves that any guy in their right mind would love that that's just I loved it you ask any other football player it's, a, it's an amazing feeling you feel 20 feet high. The dark side to it is a lot of these boys now want to just have that label. I done a I done a thing where the PFA had got me in to manage the end of season trials. Now these are boys who haven't they probably done as well as what they could do at a club. Excuse me, they get released. They go to these end of the season trials. So they've nowhere to go. And I had a meeting with them. They we trained one day and then I had a meeting with them and I said, look, just want to get a feeling for you as kids, for me as somebody who's played in the game, yeah. knows sort of semi the pitfalls, why don't you just go and get a job? Look at getting a job. He's a 21, 22. The biggest thing that I never done, which I had the chance when I was at air, because they were part-time, mm -hmm. I could have done that. I, I, I chose to train as hard as I possibly could to try and get a move, but I could have still have done, it's 24 hours in a day. Yeah. Could have yeah. still have done something else. You're lazy to you think you can't. Yeah. And a lot of them just come back, said, nah, I want to be a footballer. And then I would watch them leaving and they would jump in their Mercs and their wee Audis that they lease mm -hmm. through the PFA. Mm -hmm. And it's all fake, mate. It's all fake. They're there um, because they're not good enough to be at a club. They've been released. Mm -hmm. But they still hold on to this dream. Now, that's not a kid's fault because you're 18, 19 year old. You, you don't know where you're going in life. The problem I found was I think a lot of the clubs have responsibility to teach kids. So I think when you're coming through as a young kid, I think the club should do more to teach you, to help you. But I think at the same time, the club should help the parents. I see, I see it now with my oldest boy. There's parents running about chasing their kids, living the dream through their, through their kids, yeah. hoping their kid's going to be the next big thing. Mm -hmm. You've seen it yourself. You, you meet some dude and it's my son plays for Rangers or Celtic. Mm -hmm. They're living a dream through, and you're indirectly... You know, one percent, two percent. Somebody's going to go and have an amazing career, where they're going to hit the heights. Yeah. The rest, they're not going to. Mm -hmm. And you imagine the pressure that that's on you as a kid. Mm -hmm. You imagine you're living your dad's dream, and it doesn't quite happen for you. You feel as if you've let yourself down. You feel as if you've let your dad down. Things like that. the pressure that's on these kids to make it is enormous, which it shouldn't be because again, that's where we keep going back to the mental health and how it, it messes people up. I agree, hundred percent. I think, I think that's phenomenal what you're saying there. I did not just footballers, boxers, uh, um, sportsmen. We had JP Gallagher on last week, who's a Thai coach. Yeah. Um, top level, you know, he's got, he coaches Nico Carrillo, um, who's European champion, going for the world title. title. And um, he was talking about um, his, one of his parents being a real, you know, a real dominant pressure on him, and it took the love out of sport for him. Yeah. And when he stopped 
um, professional tie box and he just went off the rails yeah. completely and, ne- and nearly, you know, and he nearly didn't come back from that. And he, so we're seeing a lot of the now with young youth footballers taking their own life. Yeah. We're seeing that pressure. I don't think it's just the footballers' fault. I think you're, you're right, we need to educate football clubs, families, that's a huge one, yep. you know, huge one. And I also think that... Um, it's your identity, mate. I know Spencer Brown, I'd seen, obviously, you've done a few, you, you know, Spencer, Spencer Brown. Spencer's coming out, yep. com- coming on soon. So, um, I actually trained a few times with Spencer at, uh, during the tie. So I did. <laughs> um, but I, I use Spencer as an example, mm-hmm. as it's your identity, mm-hmm. which is your biggest thing. So it doesn't matter whether it's tiddlywinks, football, Muay Thai, boxing, golf. When you're so engrossed in something, it becomes your identity. So that's who you are. Yeah. And I think that's the biggest thing. If you work in Tesco's, Tesco's isn't you. You can then go and you can go and work in Asda. Or you can go somewhere else and you can go and get an art career. But with sport, it becomes who you are. So for me, when I, when I stopped playing, the one of the biggest things that I, I could not process and I could not fathom out and it took me two or three years was who was I? Who 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 actually who actually am I? Because all I've known since I was eight year old was ah oh, that's Ryan Stevenson, he's good at football. That's Ryan Stevenson the football. Spencer Brown for Spencer Brown. Any MD I speak to about Spencer is oh, he was away out in um Thailand doing Muay Thai and that he's really so his identity is that. Is then when that gets taken away from you, who are you? And there's nothing, there's no building blocks put in place. There's nothing there to educate people because you're so engrossed in what you're doing. Day in, day out, you're at the metal. Every single day, you're trying to get better. You're trying to get fitter. <clears throat> you're trying to get stronger. You have to be strong for the sport, mm-hmm. but you don't build anything for the back end of when you leave the sport and it can cripple you. Mm-hmm. And you know, as I said, I was when I left, it pretty much did cripple me. I was I was caught in that exact same cycle, and I think it's important that we that we say here that this is any level of football. It doesn't matter if you're playing SPL, um, Division One, Two, or Three. Um, sorry, Premier League or Division One, Two, or Three. Make it in the third division, like I was, or second division, first division. You've still got a whole load of people that see you as a professional footballer in all your hometown. So yes, people might say aye, but you never played at Chelsea. No, you never played at like. Chelsea and Adult or Man U or this and that. Yes, we didn't, but it's this pressure relative. cuckoo is it's all relative, you it's know, and, relative. and we can't take that away, especially in football when we're suffering a mental health crisis. And and I think it's important to realise that we've got work to do for these youngsters. As you say, it's identity and um, how you're seen with society. Do you know what I mean? You feel that pressure just that you're... Mate, I remember, I remember back to Stranraer last year and um, it took me a lot to go back and play one through just my own insecurities of trying to get back after spending so long at the game mm-hmm. um, professionally. But the last thing I wanted to do, and the, one of the biggest things which was on the fence for me, and it was Sarah that actually pushed me through it, was what happens if I go to Stranraer and I don't do well enough and then they don't want me. So regardless whether I was going to Man United, Chelsea, Real Madrid, I was going to Stranraer. And I had the fear about going to Stranraer and not doing well enough that Stranraer wouldn't want me. I'm 36 year old. Yeah. And that was me going back to that old mindset. Mm-hmm. Now I'm lucky enough that I've went through what I went through. I've got something else behind me now that there wasn't that pressure. But these kids are going contract year to year, earning not a lot of money. And even if you are earning decent money and you've got a family, you're still only going year to year. So it comes to Christmas time and you're thinking, right, I've got three months, four months, then I'm out of contract. And by the way, they'll drop you like that. Oh, they'll, yeah. they'll pull you in, and you know that, they'll pull you in. Yeah. I've been in it. I've been called into meetings where you all sit in a row on a couch like this. The manager's office is up there and he comes out and he says, Kenny, you're next. Right, I come out, oh, I've got a contract, brilliant. Right, Ryan, you're next. Ryan goes in, Ryan comes out. Now that's in front of all his teammates yeah. who, are, who he's bonded with friends with, no, I never got a contract. You imagine that does to somebody? And then you need to walk past them all and walk up the road. Mm-hmm. And you don't know what's next. You don't know what's coming. That's your money stopped. Where do you go after that? You then have to go to the outside world. And again, <laughs> as you get older, you understand 
you run your own race, you live in your own lane. Yep. So you don't really care about what other, I, I'm now at the stage where I don't particularly <coughs> care what other people think of me, as long as I do a good job with my family and things like that. But for these young kids, that is, that's what we go back to. You walk in the nightclub, as a persona about it. Mm-hmm. It can ruin, it can absolutely ruin kids. And again, I don't think there's enough help there with the parents. I don't think there's enough help there for the, the club. Um, and again, that, that can go to any walk or any sport. Um, and I think it, it's on a balance, mate. It's on a fine balance of what it actually does to people and what it does to young, because it is, it's young kids, you know, they're, they're 18, 19, 20 year old, they're only still getting started in life and see before you even know it, they could be done. I had a friend, not a friend, a friend of a friend who had played for Kilmarnock and he'd committed suicide at 26, 27. Now this was, Jesus, 10 years ago or something like that. And get released for Kilmarnock at 16. And it went on and had a decent job and everything to be fair. But committed suicide. And I spoke to his mum not long after the funeral, but do you know what she put it down to? He never recovered for getting re- uh, released for Kilmarnock. Do you know what I mean? And that's not just saying that's Kilmarnock's fault. It's no, it's, it's no, just, it's, it's the full stigma of every young kid wants to be a football player. Mm-hmm. 90% of people out there, what do you want to be? My two young, my two boys are the same. What do you want to do? I want to be a footballer. Mm-hmm. Chances of them being a footballer are minuscule. Yeah, there's no club help as well when you get released. Nothing. There's no club help. I mean, I have I can only relate back to <clears throat> getting released off Green at Morton at 19. It was a hard, I, guess, I, I went out of football for two years. Yeah. You know, two years. Just didn't even... Just didn't even. I hardly watched match of the day. Yeah. Two years. You know yeah. that was my favourite show. Half ten Saturday night. I'm gonna be out with the boys, man. I'm I'm on match of the day. That was the same. And and I didn't have that. I'm, I'm sitting there like the club doesn't. The club doesn't. They, I think they wrote a letter to me. That's how we found out. We yeah. didn't even get called in. I believe that as well. Well, no taking you on. Yeah. Good luck. I and you're na- like, what am I good at? Nah. I know nowadays it's, it's been done to the stage of some some kids getting text messages. Do you know what I mean? Which is just insane. Like if you're the manager of a club, um, or a chairman of a club, you ha- you have a responsibility. Yeah. Now whether that's, um, and it's all relevant. If you're at Rangers, you can't expect the chairman to be knowing what's happening at under sixteen, yeah. under fifteen. Yeah. But he has to have the right people in place that he knows is going to look after. Good, bad, or indifferent. If they make it, amazing. If they don't, then there has to be someone there to try and help. As I said, one the kid. But to the parents, because the parents need to understand it as well, which they don't, and I, I don't think a lot of these parents do. Um, but going back to I was the same, 31 hours when I retired, I never watched match a day for a year and a half. Never watched one game of football. Not one. That is, that is mad, isn't it? And that, that's what I'd done since I was <laughs> six year old. And I never, I genuinely never watched one game. It's a mad feeling. See, sometimes on Saturday night about eight, nine o'clock, I'd get a wee bit of anxiety just because I knew match a day was coming on and yep. I felt so... I felt disgusted with myself. Yeah. I felt as if I was nothing. But moving on. Um here's your boy. Yeah. Um what inspired you to get into football? Six my, year old, uh, you say. <laughs> six year old. My dad did um my dad had come back one day and he'd bought me Maradona's first, the Puma King boots. And uh, I grew up in a, a kind of rougher end of here and I wasn't lucky enough to have goals at the time, so my dad put the bin down. Mm-hmm. So it was one of these old bins. It was at one end of the garden. I was at the other end to the these Puma King boots on. Literally just started kicking the ball into the bin. Genuinely, that was that was how it started. Class. And um, that was it. It was just genuinely. After that, we moved. Um, not long after that, we moved to a wee village just outside here called Drongan. Mm-hmm. And every day, it was just football, football, football. And luckily enough, for that village, there's, there's three or four boys who have went on and played. Cup Broadfoot went on and played at Rangers. Um, I grew up just up the road for him, so I had I had people round about me who were the same. Mm-hmm. Which again, when you surround yourself with people, inevitable will happen. Mm-hmm. And myself and Kirk were the same age. There's two weeks in between us, and um, that's what we've done. Stuart Keem was another one. He, he played at St Mun. Um, that that was what we've done. We just went on and we played. We played football every single night. You know, you had the boys who would hang about the shops and um, I still keep in contact with a lot of them. I've still got them obviously with social media now. You've still got them on the Facebook yeah, and all that. And have you ever, ever thought about going and having a, a bottle of Buckfast or something like that, a bottle, a bottle of Mad Dog or something? These boys who were actually there, the older kind of boys, wouldn't they allow it? Mm-hmm. You know, you've got a chance of going and doing something 
and we just they just kind of they kind of looked after Respect us as well. The and, yeah, do you know that way? That's what that's what Aye. it was like. Um, and I still see them sometimes, and they still ah oh, big man, how are you getting on and. Um, how things are oh, you done that amazing like by the way it, it makes me proud it makes me proud thinking that they've helped me along the way as well um but it was a, I had an amazing amazing childhood just playing football in a, in a small village every single day class it's weird you say, you say about the, the the group of kind of bad boys or yeah. the boys who are hung about the shots there's a boy called uh, jambo he watches the podcast and um big jamie robertson great guy and one night i was i was out and i was kind of I was edging towards their group, yeah. you know, and out and I want to, I've turned up to meet them. I've got a bottle of my dog. He's like, oh, you did. Yeah. You know what I mean? You're not drinking that. Yeah. You've got, you know what I mean? And, and that's what they're kind of fathering you through because yeah. it's almost. You've got a chance. It's a town, maybe a, yeah. a, a pride thing in the town. Yeah. But four of made it from that group of friends. That doesn't happen often. No. And we all went on and done reasonably well. Obviously, Kurtz went on and had a, and a, had a really good career and he's still playing. Mm-hmm. Um, but we all, we all done we all done well, you know, we had a, a good school team at the time. The head teacher at the school, um, John Crawford, his name was, was unbelievable for us. Taught his discipline, um, gave his praise when we needed it, but cut us down at the same time. You keep in mind, you're only mm-hmm. eight, nine, ten year old, mm-hmm. but he instilled the blocks into you of, um, he was actually, he was a manager at, um, at Hurlford and Largs and the juniors. And it just installed into you what you needed. You know, it wasn't going to be easy, but this is what you needed to do: dedication, all that sort of stuff. And um, I think he was a massive, massive part in the four years going and doing really, really well. I think we, we normally find that. I want you to know if, who inspired you. So we, we normally find that players have a figure who inspired them growing up. Who was that? Who was that for you? Was that a big Zlatan Ibrahimovic or was that Ronaldo? Um, no, I, I think obviously when I was when I was growing up, I was lucky enough to be. I was twelve year old and I was staying in digs with John Terry. I was getting into training every day, and I was watching Zola. I was cleaning Jimmy Floyd Hasselbank's boots at thirteen year old. So I, it wasn't as if like I was looking for a far. I was actually there. Uh-huh. I was there. You know, looking after these guys' boots. <laughs> you, um, you were cl- you were cleaning their boots, and I was playing with our figures. Remember the zola the wee figurines. I mean, I was, mate, I'm sitting playing with them. See the thing is, I look back now and I think it's, it's crazy because I took it as that was an on, which is mental. You know, I've got stuff and I've got zola's uh, top in the house. I've got desai Marcel desai's. Um, so we actually just talking about this all day. There. I've got his semi final um, France ninety eight boots. Amazing. In my house. And see the time. He gave me them and I was like, oh thanks very much. Not not even thinking in of it. Like mm-hmm. it, it was all just that was just my life. That was just the way it was. I I was down there at 13 year old and looking back now, I wish I you wish you could go back and make yourself appreciate it. But at the time, a 13 year old, and that's just that was how I grew up. I grew up just watching these superstars. You know, I I would see these superstars playing a Saturday at Stamford Bridge or if they were playing away from home I'd watch them on the TV mm-hmm. I'd go on the Sunday and I'd be, spe- I'd be speaking to them which is mental because usually you're looking at them and all you see them is on the TV at match of the day you're sitting there watching match of the day and you're like oh, Jimmy Floyd Hassel man oh, he's amazing he's amazing I was actually sitting cleaning his boots and talking to him every every other day um, which looking back on was just crazy and it's something that I probably didn't fully appreciate Um which I wish I did. I wish I embraced it more than what I did. You said in your past that your time at Chelsea was the best time of your life. Um, was there something different about the the, the kind of the bright light? You said it's the best time of your life, but a time that that maybe gave you a, a, a false sense of yeah. your future. Um, you've just explained kind of what was what was special about the club. What would you say was your best moment as a youngster? So you were there 13 to 18? 13 to 18, I get, um, they, they saw me, they actually, I was playing for Hearts at the time, had signed a contract for Hearts um, to take me till I was 21. Oh yeah. Believe it or not. Um, at that time it was the old S forms that you would sign until you were 16. And um, I'd signed a seven year deal that would take me till I was 21. It was all agreed. It wasn't illegal, but it was like a gentleman's agreement. I was training with Hearts three times a week. Um, up in Wishaw, playing with them on a Sunday, and bad luck. I was playing against Celtic, and the chief scout from Chelsea at the time 
was up watching the Celtic striker and we stood next to my dad and said, oh, the big boy that plays for Hearts is quite a good player. And my dad turned around to him and said, that's my boy. And at that time, he didn't have mobile phones or anything like that. Mm. Phoned, the, phoned the house phone on the Sunday and said, um, listen, we want, to, we want to fly up to, we're going to fly up to Largs, will you come and meet us? They flew up to Largs, my dad and mum went and met them. Um, and at that stage, I had been down to Man United a couple of times. They were keen on having me as well. Darren Fletcher was obviously a couple of years above me. Um, there was another couple of boys who were, John Rankin, who's went on and done really, really well. He was there. Um, they were keen on me, but, you know, Chelsea had come up and took my mum and dad down to London, had had shown us all the, where I was going to be staying, what, you know, what, what my life was going to be like down there. And um, at the time, there was a lot of people saying, stay at heart. You know, you stay at home, learn your trade. Mm-hmm. And and go down if you if you know if you're good enough you'll go down at a later date. And rightly or wrongly, my dad asked me what I wanted to do, and I said I'd go to Chelsea. Um, and everything happens for a reason, mate. I, I, I genuinely believe that. And obviously, as my life went on, um, there was a, there was a stage where I thought it was a wrong, it was the wrong decision. I think if my career would have went a bit differently. Um, going down there at thirteen on my own, it's it is crazy. Um. But again, if I'd been down there, Billy Gilmer's down there and yeah. he's absolutely flying. So if I'd went down there and it all went right, it'd be the best decision in their life. It's a horrible, horrible situation for my mum and dad to make. Mm-hmm. And I think it's had major repercussions in their lives um, as well, which is a sort of dark side that nobody else sees. Yep. Um, but I went down there and listened. To it. It's Chelsea. It's, it's amazing. It's, it's, you know, you're going to... St- I'm going to stand for Bridge every other week. And I'm sitting, I, was, I, 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 I went as a ball boy. So I was, because I was young at the time, they put me as a ball boy. Mm-hmm. And then I would be taking the hampers in. So when I got to 15, 16, I was going down with the kit men, taking the hampers in. I'm walking about the dressing room when the players <laughs> are getting ready. And again, that's just second nature. That's just, yeah. that's just my life. That's just the way it is. No bother. That's what it is. And that, that was it. But um, as I said, I wish I had fully taken in what it was all about. But an amazing experience. You know, there's not many boys can say they went and played moved into London and at 12, 13 year old and played for Chelsea. I had the opportunity to play for Chelsea and I did. Rightly or wrongly, whether I messed it up or not, then, um, you know, that's just one of the things. Well, how many kids do we see going down and getting lost down yeah. in England, you know? As you're one in 100,000 or even yeah. whatever the odds are to, to make it at clubs like these. Um, in one hand, you've got some of the greatest memories of your life that you'll that'll go with you yep. for your dying days. On the other hand, you've got mass doubt yep. and maybe guilt that it was the wrong decision. And then you get the family implications that come with that. It's important to realise because many players are caught in this situation. Do I stay at Celtic, Hibs, Hearts, Rangers, or do, do I go down? What would be your advice to any young kid? I think it goes on everything. I think it goes on the kid. I think it goes on the family how your family is as a unit. I think that's a major, major thing, which I don't think... Again, I went down there and you understand as you get older, you're a commodity. Yeah. So, yeah. And I moved down there. I had signed a contract and it was something like six flights a year I had that Chelsea would pay for that I could yeah. come back up. Um, but as I said, the implications that I had on my family now, up until I went to London, myself and my dad were like that could not separate us. It was too many training. Now he sacrificed his life. I genuinely mean that. He would be up at five in the morning, coming in at five at night, having his dinner in the car while taking me to Wishaw to train with hearts. Yeah. Um, on a Sunday, taking me to games. And then I look back now and you, as a dad and I think, how hard would that be for your son moving down there at 13? So he, all he's ever known was my life growing up playing football was being at my games every single week. Him and my mum at every single game. Dad was at every single training session. I leave to go to Chelsea. Gone. That's me, I'm gone. Mm-hmm. So his his life has a massive upheaval. And I came back up, when I came back up at 18, when I left, I had such a happy house. And when I came back up at 18, it was the polar opposite. And for a long, for many, many years, I, I, I tried to work out why my dad, rightly or wrongly, has a, a major drinking problem. 
I don't particularly I've not spoke to him in years now. Um, him and my mum split up, and I might have a bit of resentment against that against him because I only remember I don't remember the good things, mm-hmm. and he went on chose drink over his family. How can he do that? But then the more you think about it, and you think. If my kid left at 13, the implications that would cripple, would cripple me because it crippled me when I lost my kids mm-hmm. um, when I was 31 for a period of time, you know. So it's like he had to deal with that for six, seven years. Um, and that's, a, that's an odd dark side of this, the, the side of football that you don't realise is yeah, for sure. Um, these kids go down there. I think it'll be different nowadays. I think, I think there is things at the bigger clubs in place to look after families and look after the kids, but. Um, at that stage and at that day and age, there wasn't really much there to help you. You just basically went down and that was it. You were the commodity. You were there, you trained every day and hopefully you'll go on and do well and they'll sell you for millions or you'll do well for that club. Was there much visiting times and stuff? Like, did you literally not get to see your mum and dad that much at all? No, I would come up four or five times a year. Oh my God. Um, that would be it. And I would fly up on a Saturday night um, and I would fly back down on a Sunday. When that was it. So you would have, obviously you would have the end of the season, you would have a a big block of four or five weeks, but the season would end, you would come back up, but straight away then you were going straight back down. So you were up for two weeks, you might be going holiday with the boys or something like that for a week, two weeks, and then the next two weeks you're preparing to go back down. So um, It's quite upsetting, isn't it? It was, yeah. I, it was, it was, it was full on. It's, it's, me thinking about it as a, a new dad. Yeah. Losing my, he's my everything, man. I know. Like, he's my everything. I'm trying well, to teach him. I mean. He can't even walk yet, and I'm trying to teach him to kick balls. I know, mate. That's what I, that's what I mean. And I think um, for a long time, I blamed my dad for a lot of stuff. So I did a lot of resentment towards him. Yeah. Still doing it in a sense. Um, that's natural. But the impact that must have had on him, because as we're saying, if you imagine that thirteen-year-old, my oldest, nine and Friday and su- Sunday, sorry. Mm-hmm. So you imagine him at three years' time. Going down to London, I, I wouldn't. Absolutely no way I would let that happen. No <laughs> I way. Probably wouldn't I, or I would move the family down, down there. Do you know what I mean? <clears throat> so that, that, that day and age, that was what happened. Dan Easier Fletcher, that, me, in that day and age, that was what happened. Dan Fletcher moved to Manchester. We had, we had they had boys. There was already Scottish boys at Chelsea, mm-hmm. so there was a couple of Scottish boys at Chelsea that had moved down, mm-hmm. and it might work for them. Um, and if it's even it worked for me. Mate, we'd be sitting here having a very different conversation. <laughs> and you like, the world was amazing, the world was rosy, but listen, it was a it was a chance we took. It was the it was a chance I wanted to take, rightly or wrongly, should I have been given that decision at that age? Maybe not. Um but it was a chance I took and I've got amazing memories. Would I change things? Probably. Um but it is what it is. I, I genuinely do. I think with the things that as you get older and you go through things in life and you have these milestones in life, you realise that um and I believe that it's all fate. What's what's for you will not go past you. Mm-hmm. Um, and if you're meant to go through tough times, you will. Um, and it's about trying to figure out how to get out of them. Yeah, I love that. At your time at Hearts, you were shifted up front <laughs> at a time the club needed you. How did you get your head round to change your position? And um, was a, how did you deal with the pressure of being the main striker? How did it all come about? I hated it. I absolutely hated it at the start. Um, <laughs> big Kev Kyle, they brought Big Kevin Kyle in. Um, Jim Jeffries had brought him in and he'd, he'd been injured quite a bit. And I was always sort of had that where I could I could turn my hand to playing in different positions, which again, as a footballer, it sometimes hinders you mm-hmm. because you're actually maybe better just being a centre midfielder and that's all you can really do. So you'll always just play there. Mm-hmm. Um, where I could sort of, they could move me out in the wing or they could play me um, different positions, but I ended up going up and playing up front, and um, I, I was ho- it was a horrible experience to start with because I didn't know what I was doing, so I just ran about, and I just thought, right, do you know what? I'll give them all, I'll do everything I possibly could, and um, as I went, obviously I, I picked up, you know, runs that I should make and where I should go and what I should do, um, and then it just kind of stuck with me, and I, to be fair, it has ever since. I think um, every other club that I've went to, I've played up front. Um, where ideally I would have liked to have been a midfielder. That that was where I wanted to play. Um, but as, as the game's evolved as well, then it's sort of, you, you play like the, the boy who plays in behind the strikers, I've kind of dropped into there obviously as well. Yeah. Um, but it just kind of evolved from Kevin getting injured 
we didn't really have MD else there for that that time because um, the window must have been shut, so you couldn't sign MD to bring MD in. And I went up and I done reasonably well. I scored a few goals, and then it just kind of stuck with me. I think it's important to understand it's not easy changing position, even though even if it's the slightest change, you know what yeah. I mean? How did you get your new sense of awareness? Being the main striker was a lot different from being. Uh, a it, was, it was it was it was horrible because again, if you think. Um, Trying to explain it for people who maybe don't understand it as as well as people who are in the game is, if I'm playing midfield, I'm always I'm looking at the goal. Mm-hmm. If I'm a striker, eighty percent of the time the goal's behind me, so I'm looking back the way. So it's all difficult and different because your body position totally changes. Yep. Um, as a midfielder, you're used to seeing the play build up, then you can make a run, and I was always really good at picking times to make runs. So I would always come in kind of later. Um, whereas a striker, you're the first main point of you're making the first run. So yep. it was understanding what run do I make? Where do I make if we're playing with two up front? It's understanding where your striking partner might go. He might prefer to go to the front, so then I'll need to go to the back. Um, it was all these sort of things. And all along the time you're thinking, I have absolutely no clue what I'm doing here. Because again, all I've ever done was play midfield. Um but quite quickly tried to pick it up and I thought, listen, the worst comes to worst, what I'll do is I'll just run myself into the ground and if I get half a chance, I'll try and take it. Yeah. And um so that, most strikers do anyway. Pretty much, <laughs> mate, pretty much. If it was anywhere, listen, I was never shy in shooting, so I just thought if I, if I get half a chance, shoot, hit the target, listen, what's the worst that can happen? Um, and again, I was very, very privileged. I'm not daft. I've had, you've had a lot of lows in your career. But every single week I was picking a Hearts jersey up to put it on. And I understood what it meant to the fans. I understood what it meant to the club to play for that club. I, I, I knew I knew exactly the privilege I had. So to be doing that week in, week out as my job and to be getting paid to do that as my job, I knew how lucky I was. So whether it was up front, right back, left back, I couldn't care less. Um, I just wanted to go and do, what I, do my best for the club. The atmosphere at Tynecast was unbelievable. I've only been there once. Um, I was injured. Um, we, Adam played Hearts in the in the cup, and the uh, people are so close to the pitch. Yeah, the fans. Yeah, it's pretty. You know, it's intimidating. I. <laughs> hey, by the way, it's intimidating if you're playing bad as well. I played. We played against Dundee United on a Wednesday night once, and um, I had an absolute holocaust. And I mean, like <laughs> ridiculous. It was like I was getting the ball. And I, one of the games, you know, it's like where you just. I'm always thinking a step, two steps ahead of myself. And I honestly, God, I was four steps behind. I could not think about where I was going. <laughs> I was passing it out the pitch and I ended up getting subbed. And to be fair, I was dying to get subbed because I just, it just wasn't, it wasn't happening. And uh, I got a stand innovation for my, <laughs> for, the, for my own support yes. getting subbed. Yes. So, um, but listen, it was amazing, amazing place, mate. Amazing place. Unbelievable. Um, it was actually some of the times, some of the games that we played in, you would walk out and because the atmosphere's that tight to you, the actual decibels that are in your head, so you, it's like it, it's raising up and down in your head. It's, mm-hmm. it is mental. And you ask any any player that's not playing for Hearts, where's your favourite away game? They always say Tyne Castle because it is electric. You know, the games against the old firm, Derby games, is just second to none. So again, I, I knew how privileged I was playing and things like that. Um, and it was something that when I left... I majorly missed now. When I left the first time and I went to Ipswich, Ipswich had 40,000 seat stadium, mm-hmm. but it was nothing like Tynecastle. And I missed it. And then obviously the second time when I went back, the second time I, I left and I went to Partick Thistle, I, I struggled for it, mate. I genuinely struggled for it. See the addiction of every second week playing there and getting out and you know that the atmosphere is rocking, that you're there to do a job. Like you, you understand, as I said to you, the enormity of, of what you're representing. Um, when, I, when I left for the last time, I really, really struggled. Um, right. Just said it before, it was like, I can only imagine it as it being like a heroin addict mm-hmm. that that fix every other Saturday. I mean, like the, the week, the week I, I enjoyed away games because we always took a big crowd away. But the week leading up to home games, see so come the Wednesday, Man, you were, you, I was bouncing into, I was bouncing into work. You know, I'd be, I'd be, I'd be preparing for the Saturday because I knew it was a big game coming up on the Saturday. Every game at Tynecastle was massive. Mm-hmm. 
Um, and then when it stopped, and no disrespect about the party thistle, but you go from 20,000 a week to, and that, you know as well, that atmosphere to two, 3,000 a week, it kind of just it, it caught me. It caught me cold, so it did. Um, but an amazing place to play. Do you think that's been kind of the same with the fans getting taken away the now? Um, you've seen a lot of players just haven't been able to. to I think themselves. it's difficult, mate. I think it's difficult. I think um, I think it's worked for some. I don't think it's worked for other. You use obviously people. People will hate me. I love me here, but you use Rangers and Celtic for an example. I think it's massively helped Rangers. Oh, why? Because I think um, previous seasons, I think the. Listen, they've always improved and they've oh, done well. Our fans are brutal. Aye. That's what, that's they've, done, what that's. They've, they've, they've done well. Um, but I think when it's came to the nitty gritty, a bit of pressure with the fans being there, oh, yeah. I think some of the players have, have crumbled underneath it. That on the flip side, I've played at Parkhead um, and I know when the crowd get going Celtic because they're in that mentality. It's all mentality, mate. They're in that mentality of winning, winning, winning. So when the crowd goes, you could feel Celtic getting a jag. You mm-hmm. could feel Celtic... If they were when they playing that well, the crowd would lift them, and everyone would sort of just lift for there. And I think Celtic have massively struggled for that. Um, where I think Rangers has worked in their favour, um, but taking that away for Rangers, I think they've I think they've come on leaps and bounds this year. That's not absolutely um, agree. I'm a beloved Rangers man. Yeah, um, I've been at Ibrox for most of them games last season. Yeah, and. Uh, we do the the brutality. We, the, our fans are quite brutal. Yeah, we, we, they know we we know as Rangers fans, we are quite brutal. There's an expectation there, and um, as there should be. To be fair, yeah, as, as there should, should be. be. But sometimes I think you can see 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 mindset now is a big thing. That's why yeah. I do this mindset and mental health. Players, your like, prime example, mate, is Tavernier. Tav, he, he, he Tav was is, crumbling under that pressure. Well, there you go. He? That, that's last year. Remember, he went through a stage where you could just tell. That he was, it was, it was. You could, you could see, you could, you could see physically, you could see mentally, it was getting to him. Really awkward to watch, wasn't uh, it? Because it's, it's horrible. Because mm-hmm. for me personally, I know exactly. I, I can, I can think what's in his head. You can think what's in his head, and it's a horrible place <laughs> to be, mate. It is, it is, it's lonely. Yeah. It's horrible. It's difficult to find a way back out of it. And you look at him this year. There's a freedom about him. He's scoring goals. He's setting goals up. He's doing everything because he's a top, top player. There's an arrogance about him. A good arrogance about him, um, but as you said, the reason why you do this because it just shows you how big mate, mindset's everything. Mm-hmm. Mindset is this is just a shell. Yeah, the mindset is everything, and, and it was it is difficult to see Shane Duffy's your other prime example. Shane Duffy might sixty five thousand people there behind his back, giving them a and you yeah. come on, you can go. He would probably interact better with that than what he is with nobody I being there. I think he would have been a different player, to be honest. I think so as well, because he's used to that. That's what he. That's what he's used to. He's used yeah. to playing in big games down in England. That's what he's. That's what he's built for. He then comes up to Scotland. There's no crowd. You know, he's had a couple of bad games. Everybody does. Um, and everybody just jumped on this bandwagon. And you, again, it's difficult to watch because you know, one, I don't know him personally, but he'll be a good. I imagine he'll be a good person. Two, he's a really good player. Yep. And it's so difficult to watch. Now, I get people who have this banter and Rangers fans absolutely love it and you see all the jokes going about and blah, 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 blah. But at the same time, mate, he's a human being. Yep. And it's, it's difficult. To, it's difficult to see and it's difficult to watch. For me, for me, I find it difficult, so I do. I, try, I actually try not to watch it. I try, not, I try to stay away from it all um, because I find it difficult. I think it me because we've had anxiety and the pressure on that that, that you can you can relate to it. See, when I, where I stand... If you had a group of people who hate to have, I'm telling you, man, oh See? my God, they give them pelters. Like, and I'm thinking, do you think that's really going to pick him up and make him play better? A player that you can visually see is struggling yeah. with the pressure cooker. He, when you keep shouting at him, he's going to get worse. He is the captain. They big him up. And that's that's what I think. Like, we were on the group chat and they were all talking, Ranger, there's like four Rangers fans, a couple of Celtic fans, and we're all good pals and they're like, do you think if the fans were in the, if the fans were allowed in this season would Rangers win the league? Personally, I don't know. I, and people come on here and slaughter me and all that. I'm a huge Rangers fan just the next to the next person, but our fans, you know what I mean, sometimes from last year, I, I don't know, if we kept the first half of the season, there would be a sh- like we did the last yeah. two years, January would have been yeah. a really intense. I think it would have been closer. Yeah. But you can't take it away from Rangers. They've won. They, they're they're, oh, they're listen, invincible now in the league, so you cannot. I think that's important. I think. Um, I think this season will be the making of Rangers. 
I know they're going to fly on. And I think now. next year when the crowds are back in, they'll embrace what's happened this year. And listen, I've been absolutely amazing. Of, of course, they You just know and I know. And I, most football fans know when it gets to the nitty gritty. Yeah. And again, that all goes back to mindset. Listen, the biggest, biggest clubs in the world, they have people like yourself mm-hmm. who are in. Mate, I, I sat, was it St. Johnston? It might actually be St. Johnston and Hearts, and we brought something in and we had a bit of string with a paper clip. And we were to try and move the paper clip. And this was all about your mindset. Mm-hmm. So that was 10, mm-hmm. 15 years ago we mm-hmm. were doing that. So mm-hmm. all these clubs have, because it is all about your mindset. Yeah. And it gets to the nitty gritty part of the season. Whether you support Rangers or Celtic, whatever it is, the mindset right now is Rangers are that far off it, or have been that far off it when all the crowds and everyone were involved. Celtic were used to winning. That's what they've done. Yep. That's what they've done. So their mindset is when the going gets tough, they win. Now it's flipped on its head majorly. Now that it might be down to circumstances. It might just be down to the fact that Rangers have kicked on, which they have. Whether if crowds are involved, we'll never know. Um, they take nothing away from them. They've done, they're doing remarkably well in Europe. Um, which I don't support Rangers or Celtic, so I'm. But it's no, it's no yep. skin off my nose. Um, and I like. I, at the end of the day, I want Rangers and Celtic to be fighting out. For too long, it's been crap. Oh, it's been awful. Um, and I hope next year when everybody's back in, it does kick on again and it goes to because it's what it's what we want to see. You want to see Rangers and Celtic, and I want to see you want to see all the fans flying. You know, absolute old firm games where nobody knows what's going to happen. Top of the league, two or three points in it either way. You know, that's that's what we all want. Um, but it's it's, it's horrible. You go back to Tavernier, and it's I don't know I, the mindset of some fans. I'll never be able to understand. I genuinely, I, and I find it difficult at times. Is he plays, he's not out there to have a bad game. Yeah, exactly. He's a captain of your club, and he's trying as hard as he possibly can. Um, Sometimes it just doesn't happen. You know, you'll go through stages where you'll play well, where you'll not play well. Mm-hmm. The only way, I'm not saying we should all be sitting there like cheerleaders with pom-poms shouting, yeah, exactly. well, well done, James, well done, James, When he, if he's having an absolute stinker. But I think there is a line. And I think football's the only sport that you can cross and there's no repercussions. Mm. You know, I've been spat on. And then if anybody spat on me in the street, I'd hook them. Yep. But if I'd done that in a football game, I'd be banned. Yep. But the fan wouldn't so it's acceptable for the fan to spit on me and I've just got to accept it. There is a massive line with football where I think it does need to change. We let people um, get away with far too much. We see with the racist. Just because they've got too much money. You're about to say the racism, I go to Ibrox and it happens at every stadium. Let's yep. not lie. Let's not lie. Um, I go to Ibrox and when Taff was playing bad, oh yeah, Black Rash, Black Rash, Alfredo, Ojo was the one. I went nuts at and tried to fight with the two guys behind me. Yeah. And um, two boys are like, oh, Joe, get back to Africa. You're no good. I'm like, what? That's mad. So I'm, I'm in front of you. Madness. You know, eh? Madness. I'm, you know, I'm, know. I'm half American. Yeah. No. I looked through. They maybe not seen that. I've got a hat on and that, my scarf on. I've looked through and then it's been a kind of wee bit of a bunny. What, what do you think gives you the right to just because they're paid a bit of money, you have the right to sm- smash their families and smash yep. and stuff like that? Did you not get abuse one time about your pregnant girlfriend? Uh, may I have it? I've had so much. Like so what, many. What, why do you think fans and feel free to do this? Oh, they're getting paid. Yeah, you get paid for your job. Yeah. You, do, you, you don't. You, you don't get fans absolutely no. abusing you. I've, I've, said that, I've, I've said that before. It's like um, if I walked on a building site and started hammering abuse at a bricky, he'd fling a, a brick at me. <laughs> do you? Or he'd batter me. You know, <laughs> but it's acceptable for that bricky to come to a game on a Saturday and say, "I'm this, I'm that." My missus is a cow, she's this, she's that. Listen, as I said to you, we go back to the mindset thing at the start. I, I actually enjoyed that to a certain extent because I knew that I was getting under people's wick. I knew they hated me because I was a good player. Mm-hmm. At the end, it buckled me. It absolutely destroyed me, so it did. And I could have 50,000 people in a stadium and 49,999 loving me. One person would say one thing, and I would go home and I think about that one person. I had and a that big was problem all, with that. That was uh, that again. That's all down to your mind. Mm. I train. I'd, I'd talk and and teach a lot of footballers. Mail me about their mindset and how yep. they deal with pressure and stuff like that. You'd be surprised at the level they're playing at and they're crumbling. Yeah, you know what I mean. I'm the same. I think since uh, since obviously I've came out and um, said the, the, the situation that I was under and 
um, how I found it difficult. And uh, I was never one, I never obviously, when I went through the kind of, the kind of tough stage that I went through, I never really went, I never went and seen MD. Um, I always, there was just something inside me that said that I had to, was I going to go one with the other? That was basically it. Um, and I had to try and find a way through it. And obviously as I've came through it and I've came out about how I was feeling and the things that um, were affecting me, the amount of boys that messaged me off the back of that on my Instagram and things like that is mental. Like you wouldn't believe me, yeah. honestly. And then not even just football players, the amount of guys that just message me in general, um, whether they're struggling just with life, with problems with their kids or their partners or um, anything is absolutely insane. It's, t- it's t- life's tough. Aye, it is you mental, know? and I think there's still this stigma that, um, which I, I admit I, I find it tough sometimes talking about it. But mm-hmm. again, going back to, I knew how privileged I was to play football, so I understood the privilege that I had. I understand with this that I've got the opportunity to have a platform, same as yourself. People ask me on things or ask me to speak about it. I'd be doing people a disservice by not speaking about it. I'm keeping it to myself. You know, I might keep it to myself and I might find my way through it and everything be fine. But when I've got a platform to actually try and help other people, which I think when you get to the stage that as you get older and you understand things, um, helping people's the best thing in the world. And it's the best thing. Everything feeling. else. <laughs> everything else is shite. It's all secondary, yeah. mate. Nothing else matters. They're, they're genuine, isn't it? If you can, if you can make somebody's day, that's genuinely better than making any amounts of money, making, doing anything. Because that's the biggest achievement you can make is actually helping other people. So I understand that the the platform I have now is a lot bigger than what I actually had when I played football because I've got a chance of actually helping people. I love that, mate. <laughs> that's that's <laughs> me as well. The helping people is my drug. Yeah. People, people say that to me, you know. <clears throat> it's my drug. I want to help people. I want to impact people. I want to change their lives. I want to help them with mental health. Um, I leave my inboxes open and I spend a lot of time on Instagram replying to people and talking them through their bad time. Yeah. I love doing it. I didn't have that when I was when I was younger and I love doing it. And um I, I love how you say that, I resonate with that so much. Um I've been I've been talking to the um Street League, which is a, a fantastic um organization in Scotland. I've got their top in my bag. Um I'm going to one of the boys wants you to sign it for him. I'm going to give it back to him. I know, I know, but these guys are brilliant. You know, they're, they they've not had the best lives and they, yep. they, they go straight. There. So they're doing they're doing Zoom calls now, and I'm speaking on one next week. I think it's only right that we um, we talk about the enormity of the Edinburgh Derby. Now, me being a Rangers fan, the old firm. We, See, four days before the old firm, you start getting tingles. Yep. You know what I mean? You start getting like, oh, you know what's happening. You've got Sky Sports on, you're tightening up, you have a wee, wee secret what Celtic up to, you, yeah. know, you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> and um, it comes in, but the Edinburgh Derby, Rangers Celtic fans might jump on this, you know what I mean? But it is enormous. Mate, it's all relevant. It's just, um, the old firm's the old firm. Now, globally, it's a massive, massive oh. derby because everybody knows what it is. It's the old firm. But you ask a Hibs fan, a Hearts fan, it's the biggest game in their life. Hearts v Hibs. Uh-huh. You ask a Kilmarnock and Air fan, what's the biggest game in their lives? It's Kilmarnock v Air. Mm-hmm. So every every derby for that fan, no matter whether there's 60,000 at it or six, it's the biggest game of their li- the, the fans' lives. And it was the same for us. The, the night that I joined them, um, the night that I joined Hearts, I'd done my medical at 11 o'clock at night, get past, the window was shutting at 12, and I'd signed. And uh, I came back outside with my agent and Jim Jeffries had came back outside with us and there was a big massive hearts crest that was lit up in the stadium. And he said, um, he'd try to sign me for Kilmarnock six months earlier. And he just was going to turn around and the, the jet's the jet. Do you know what I mean? Like it is what it is. And he said, uh, you understand the enormity of this club? He obviously a pure hearts man at the time, uh, still is. Um, you understand the enormity of this club? And I said, aye, aye, I do, Gaffer, I do. And he said, but do you really? And I says, no, no, honestly, I do. And he said, well, you get to work tomorrow. And I said, right, cool, brilliant. And he were under no illusions what it was like to play for Hearts. So whether you are playing Motherwell, Air United, Cowden Beath, you understand what you are representing Hearts. Mm-hmm. My first derby game, we played Hibs away. And uh, 
we're to meet the bus at 10 o'clock and I've jumped on the bus so I've got the car jumped on the bus and the gaffer sitting and Billy Brown are sitting and I mean just staring straight ahead like tunnel vision you ready to go you ready to go to war aye gaffer aye the TV's up the bus and it's just hearts music on a loop with hearts games a hearts <laughs> going against Hibs and this is on a loop just on a loop on a Brilliant. loop and it's just a heart song playing over and over and over. And we've got a police escort down uh, Princess Street all the way to, to Easter Road. Mm-hmm. And this is just playing on a loop. So you're, you're sitting in the bus and you're like, right, this is going to be... And again, I'd never been to, I'd never been to an Edinburgh Derby before before that day. And um, you get down towards the ground and you can feel this buzz about the place. You get into wow. the stadium and you go in and... Uh, the kit man's obviously get the heart songs on and that first experience um playing in that derby was was unbelievable and i was lucky enough that i went on i only lost one derby the all the derbies i played in and the one derby i lost the the wee uh the wee hibs kit man had put the their speaker out in the 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 hall he wouldn't do that playing that stupid um what's that stupid song proclaimer song they play whatever it is anyway the whatever they play um, and the manager was like I never let this can happen again and honest to God I can't remember we could beat once I think, I think I drew twice and the rest of the time we beat we just had we had someone over Hibs that they would not beat us and it was installed for me personally it was installed by Jim Jeffries obviously just that day getting on the bus that you understood exactly what you were going and I mean some of the memories I have in the derbies you know they are the highlight of my career. Um, you're going back. I'd scored the winner in uh, a cup game at Easter Road. I don't think I slept for about three days. I remember getting back into the house that night and um, I was living on my own at the time. So I must have, it was a night game, so I must have got back to you about 12 o'clock and just sitting on the couch with my suit on. And I just, you were just sitting there, but you could still. F- you, you were just tingling, everyone was tingling about you because of the atmosphere, because you understand that, especially as a footballer, like, as much as that moment's gone, what a moment that was, like nobody can ever take that away from me. Yeah. Nobody can ever take that feeling away from me. That's that's there, I still see the goal now, people post about it, and um, that's that a the memory. Uh, the, kind of, the one where I turned and I hit it. Unbelievable. Um, what a screamer. But that's a memory that nobody can ever take away from me. Mm. Now you have through all the highs and the lows. The day I die, I'll die having done that. And I've been brung joy to how many fans. But that's, mm. we do that. I go back to being six, seven year old, playing the wee village, playing Wembley doubles and scoring goals and you're running about pulling your top over your head. That that was that, was <laughs> that moment. Um, and that was, that was the epitome of living your dream. Mm-hmm. Um, and doing it in a derby was just unbelievable. So that goes, if I can remember this one, I watched the game, you're on the left side of the park, just outside the box, you turn and smash it. Yeah. It just floats right in it. Yeah. That was incredible. Just turned it. Um, Jason Holt at the time had played it into me and um, my knee was bashed at the time. So I had uh, I had done all my ligaments in my knee and I'd been taking injections to just get me through the game. And I tried to train the day before we had trained and I tried to train and I basically couldn't train. Um but we, we were down in numbers and the manager was like, look, is there anything you can do? If there's anything you can do, please play. So just the way I'm programmed, you know, that old school mentality, yeah. I'm going to play. So I'd got a couple of jags, um, had got up in the morning, knee was still bashed. Went out for the warm up at the game, knee was still, went back in, I said to the physio, I said, listen, just tape my knee into place. So you can see on the, the thing, I had a massive big knee strap and basically just taping my knee yep. in place. And, uh, had taken a jag that basically a cortisone jag that numbs you for the eyebrows down and uh, <laughs> but it's one of the things where you take the jags you know what it's like you're kind of I've been there you're, you're, not, you're, you. you're not fully there you're at your bin a wee yeah, bit yeah. and um, I remember you played the ball into me and see be fair me I, I didn't really know I, I was never going to run away from MD mm-hmm. so it was literally just I'm turning I'm hitting let's see what happens and luckily enough I managed to get a good connection on it and it's when Smack bang right in the top corner. Yeah, you scored a few good goals against Hibs. You scored against Celtic, am I right? And you I scored against Celtic, scored against you Rangers. Scored against Rangers. You, yep. I think that so. was maybe the near the 80th minute you scored against it was us. I, I was raging. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that was right. I think we'd, 
one shot and goal, and that was me for about <laughs> so you did, two, uh, two yards. Out. <laughs> one shot and goal, and then I ran, a, I ran away as if I'd scored like the best goal you've ever seen in your life. Right, right man, um, scoring against three just a but again, like. That was, I think that was my, that must have been my first year at Hearts. So I, I've gone for playing Brecon City on a Saturday um, to play in a time castle against Rangers, and I think at the, at the time that had taken us, we were, there was all much of a muchness in the league. Obviously, Rangers and Celtic went and pulled away for us, but it was yeah. kind of like February, March time, so it was like we were still doing reasonably well. Yep. Um, and it was obviously a big goal at that stage in the title race. Now, we were never going to win the title, but it was still all the hype about it. Um, and six months before that, I was playing at Brecon and Cowdenbeath. So to score, even though it was a tap in for two yards, to score against Rangers, who Rangers and Celtic are the biggest mm-hmm. teams in the country. And if you're not playing for them, you want to score against them. Um, so I, I, it was an amazing feeling to be able to do that. It's an incredible shift of pressure. Um, that I like how you talk about Jim Jeffries when you were on the bus. Yeah. Um, that's a mindset. Yep. He then makes just a hearts as everything yep. mindset. That can that can be the difference between between you know that that last ten minutes where you need where he needs that last it's you know lost now, mate. ten percent out here, and I think that is lost. That is it? lost now. I think um, I look back on I look back in coming through and growing up and the best. The best single year I've had in my career was my YTS days. I earned sixty-two pound a week, and there was just a bunch of boys. You cleaned your boots. I washed. I washed my duty. So my duty was I had six boys' boots that I cleaned every single day. Mm-hmm. I cleaned all the balls after training, so it was something like ninety odd balls every single day. Wow. And I'd be in the shower with my shorts and t-shirt on, scrubbing these balls, and then putting them up in the dryer for the next day. You were cleaning toilets. Chelsea would play a home game and you were cleaning the stadium after it. And that all built the foundation of you as a player and you as a person as well. You had to have this durability about you. You had to have this thick skin. You had to, you, this work ethic. Nowadays, it's you turn up and you get a merc thrown at you and everything's, everything's a bit easy. You know, there, there is no YTS days. Um, and I think that's lost now. I genuinely do. I think with the kids coming through nowadays, um, listen, times have changed. I understand that as well. That the social media and everything, the world, the world's evolved. The world's changed, but I still think that building, that building block of uh, being a YTS is something that massively, massively missed um, in the footballing world. Half the stuff that went on, mate, you wouldn't get away with it. You would get done. I remember Phil, Phil Neville said that. You watch that class of '92, mm-hmm. and um, they talk about it, and. They, they all sit there, Ryan Giggs, David Beck, and Phil Neville, and they all say, half the stuff that went on, you wouldn't get away with. My initiation at Chelsea, and it was literally, you went in naked to the first team changing room <laughs> for a minute. And uh, they all, had, all the first team boys had flip-flops, and they would batter you with oh, flip-flops. Yeah. And um, that was like your initiation. So yeah, there were some boys who would not take it and not go in, and then the first team boys would pepper them every single day, or... Right, okay. You <laughs> take it and you go you, in. You should all get the jail for that now. Uh, <laughs> that's what I mean, mate. You get the jail for that now. I went in and I just grabbed... We, Zola was about five foot and I thought, right, I'll pick the weirdest one, just jump on him, start pep yes. on him. Um, and the, the boys loved all that. The, big boys the boys loved right. that. Do you know what I mean? And that that's completely lost now because you don't have any of that. And these boys come through now and they don't really know and understand what it takes. And I think that hampers them later in life as well because you don't have that. It's like, it's like being an apprentice bricky and just going straight in and trying to build a house. You can't do it. It's, no. it's impossible. No. Um, and I think that's missed. An apprentice brickies get it, man. So they do. That's what I mean. It's Anyone like, in a building I mean. site, they get Of course. Tortured. Of course. But it's just, that's, that's, you ask an apprentice, see when the apprentice becomes the top man, yeah. he looks back on that and he said, that. how did you get to become the top man? By doing your apprenticeship. Yeah. It's, it's the way of the world. It's the only way. If they brought the YTS days back, your parents would be calling slave labour, wouldn't they, man? Oh, he shouldn't be doing this. He's here to play football. Shut up, man. This is how, this this is is how he builds the mindset. Aye. This is how he understands. I know, I know now parents go in and complain to managers that, um, oh, I think you've been too hard on my kid. I think this and you think that. You're setting them up to fail. There's, there's a, and again, we go on about mindset and all that. It's a, ma- listen, it's a great thing that it's, we can all help each other. And there's a platforms there for us to help each other, but seeing the same turn, we're not here to be mollycoddled because that's no life. There has to be a happy medium, mm-hmm. so there has to be that support mechanism of help there if genuinely you're struggling. Yeah. But there also has to be this other part where 
you have to learn to dig deep. You have to learn at times when times are tough. You can't just run and hide or say, oh, I've had enough. You have to find something within you where you can dig deep. And the YTS days, as amazing as they were, that's what they, that's what they taught you. They taught you, they instilled into you um, that you might need to dig deep. You know, I, I've seen boys, there was boys at, <laughs> there was boys at Hearts who had, um, I don't know what they'd done, but they had done, they had done, they'd done something wrong anyway. And the manager told them to go, I think they'd actually played golf. That was what it was. They played golf on a day that they shouldn't have played golf. And uh, the gaffer said to him, bring your golf clubs in the next day. They brought the two boys, bring their golf clubs in. They said, get them on your back. You know, the back, the thing on the back, run up and down every stadium, uh, every stair in the stadium. And he made them run up and down every single stair oh, yeah. in the stadium. Just, you know, play golf on a Thursday now, will you? <laughs> but see if you've done, you done that nowadays. You, uh, you, know. you, you, you get hung for that. All the players would fall out, fall out with you. You wouldn't get spoken to for weeks. They'd lose love for you. And for then the your, agent would be, your agent would be uh, phoning in complaining. And then your mum and dad be phoning in complaining and all that. Uh, and, yeah, everything. Yes. and as I said to you, there's, there's, there's definitely, there's got to be a happy medium. So there is, having these things in place, this awareness of um, having mental health and that all that, the world has changed. The world is more difficult now mm-hmm. because social media, whether it, it was meant to work the way it has, or it wasn't. Um, it can cause problems. We know that it's got its effects and it's got its negative negative effects. Um, but you still need that other side where it installs you know morals like in you. I like what you're saying there about the YTS effect and the um, and the grafting because then when people get dropped um, and have to go and fend for themselves, they know that feeling of grafting. They know that feeling. They're going to have to work yep. to get a job now, whether it's in Morrison's or. Or in a close shop, they're going to have to to graph now. I think we are muddy cordial and going back to the when players do get dropped or out of contract and get released, they they, they can carry themselves a bit more because what are we all like when we come out of school we've been muddy coddled and then when they say right go get a real job right move out yep. you don't know what you do yep. you don't know you're fine <laughs> what's your budget for the month you've spent it in a, about three years I know, you know mate, what I mean I know. you spent you spent you've 200 quid in a you've, food shop because you've, you've went mental <laughs> you've went to cruise and you're six months behind in your money already last so, night and I was the world's worst for that you spent some time at Ipswich you scored a screamer in the last day of the season Ipswich voted it goal of the season. What's yeah. it like to score goals like that down south? It was uh, no, it was nice. It was a it was it was a decent goal to be fair. Um I enjoyed it. And I came back in after the game actually. So you, the last game of the season you're thinking, right, I've scored an absolute screamer. Uh, 35 yards off the I think it hit the bar, hit the goal line, hit the bar and then went back in. And um, I remember coming back in and Paul Jewell was the manager at the time and he absolutely battered me. So he did. <laughs> so I'd come in thinking, oh do you know what? Gonna go up the road. We've got six weeks off. Gonna go on holiday. Um, what a, what a way to end the season. And I come in and he just absolutely <laughs> battered me. If you think that's how you're going to be able to play, take that goal. That goal was crap. And they could do that at this level. Um, wow. If you think you're going to come back down here next season, because that was my first season there. If you think you're going to come back down here next season and play the way you've played today, he's like, you be as well staying in Scotland with that shite up there. <laughs> and I remember just thinking. I can't even believe that. Like, I genuinely just want to come in and be like, listen, lads, well done. With a great end to the season. I'll see you in six weeks' time. Go and have a good holiday. And he absolutely peppered me. <laughs> it's like Sunday League football, isn't it? When the manager hates something you do in the first 10 minutes, you go and score a hat trick, you come in. What shite was that? Mate, you know I mean? He was an angry, angry <laughs> Liverpool just guy for Liverpool, just angry Scouse guy. Oh, so he was like, and he, again, I remember that he, he just absolutely battered me. And I remember all the boys, Jimmy Bullard was sitting next to me. And Jimmy's obviously on that one crack off, but no well in the head. And he's got an elbow on me and elbow on me and elbow on me. And he's just sniggering away. And I'm like, I said, what about that? And Jimmy's like, I thought it was a good goal, mate. But he said, he's absolutely mental. And again, you come, <laughs> I come back down for pre-season and I thought, right, obviously I need to be playing better than what I was. No matter how good a goal it was you scored, I need to be playing better than what I was. Oh, he almost went to Australia. Yep. Cancelled last minute. Yep. What happened? Um, I had everything in place, mate. Was was good to go. And um, they thought of leaving the kids. So I was going to get there on my own. And um, at that stage, I had left. Thought, right, you see boys are good to Australia. Build a, a sort of new life for yourself. Good country. And, um, mate, I'd packed my case and everything. My mate had come down the day before. I'd spent the full day in the house packing all my stuff up. I'd packed the house up, packed my cases. was ready to go. And um, was sitting the night of my dinner. And 
my mate had left, we sat on my own having my dinner and I thought, I can't, I can't do this. I can't leave my kids. The thought of, at this stage, I was seeing my kids once or twice a week at that stage. The thought of going three, four months without seeing them. Mm-hmm. I couldn't, I, see to be fair mate, what I was doing was running away from my problems. That that was, the, the, the brass, the brass neck, it was, I was going to go there. Now it might have worked, you could go across here and have a great life and everything, but I definitely didn't want to believe in my kids. Um, and when I sat back and I thought, right, why am I doing this? What is the reasons that I'm going to be doing this for? It was I was running away from the problems that I had at the time. Moving away, especially so far, when you've got so much going on in your life at the time, yeah, and you're probably at your lowest. Yeah. Um, if you're comfortable, do you want to talk us through um, what was going wrong? We always ask um, guests to come on and talk about a really dark place they've came, they've been to. Um, and how they've recovered and, and came back from that, which you you yeah. have um, tenfold. Um, yeah, I, I, at the time, I think when I when I retired, uh, I never retired because I had to retire, an uh, injury or getting old. I had retired because mentally I was broken, so I, I couldn't. I just couldn't oh. do it. I liked the training every day because nobody saw me, so I would go to training. I was running about the boys, mm-hmm. and I loved it come to a game and it would get a Saturday morning and I would be petrified, which was never like me. If you ask anybody that knows me playing football, I'm large on life. Mm-hmm. I, I, I'm in the middle of it. I want to be in the middle of it. And I just hated it. I, I was just, I was absolutely broken. And um, I retired and then obviously the, the, the chance of, of going to Australia came about and I thought, right, I'd spent about six months just training at my mate's gym every day, not really knowing where I was going in life. Was struggling with um, not seeing my kids. I was I, I was only seeing my kids once or twice a week at the time, um, and I just couldn't. I couldn't cope with it. I genuinely just couldn't cope with it. I went for seeing my kids every single day, tucking them into their bed at night, seeing them in the morning, to seeing them maybe on a Saturday afternoon for five or six hours, and then them going back to their mums, and. Uh, it just it absolutely ruined me. It genuinely just it, it ruined me beyond repair at the time. And as I said previously, I just thought that going to Australia at the time, right, that's a good idea. I can go out there, I can build myself my own life and I'm away from Scotland where everybody sort of knows knows me and I can just go out there and I can just sail off into the sunset. You bollocks, it's never going to happen. I knew, I, I knew it was not, I was lying to myself. And I was, again, as I said, I was running away from my problems. And um, packed all my stuff, ready to go. Couldn't go because I, I genuinely could not leave the kids. And um, I just, I just buckled even more after that. It just got worse and worse and worse. And for about two and a half years, um, every day, I woke up, and I just didn't want to be here. It was just, it was, it was just horrendous. Oh, it's, it's even harder that you've retired. Yeah. It's a hard time for a professional footballer, especially someone who's been in the game as long as yourself. Yep. Um, there's a big void to fill. Yep. You know, getting to see your kids, so you're hardly getting to see your kids. That's hard enough. We know of the boy that went viral who committed suicide because of it. Yep. And that kind of brought it all to light about about that. And um, But not touching too much on that. You haven't put the smiley face on. You're still a professional footballer. Yep. Were, you, were you starting to just not go out to events? Were you, or were you drinking and um, all the bad stuff that comes with that? No, I mean, I just, um, I done loads and loads of stuff for the BBC um, and radio, TV, uh, that I just basically stopped doing. They, you know, they would message me, can you come up and do this? Can you do that? No, I'm not doing that. Don't feel like doing that. Um, the only time I ever felt safe was in the house at night for whatever reason. I feel like eleven o'clock onwards to like five in the morning, I felt safe. See, when I woke up in the morning and the world was hustling and bustling again, I was just a bag of nerves. I was hot. I was just. I felt hot. I didn't want to go out. I didn't want to see MD. Um, I went to the gym. My mate owns a big gym down in here, and he would message me constantly. Now these guys probably at the time knew I was going through a bit of trouble, but not to the extent of what I probably what I was going through. And without them just messaging me, come in and train, I ended up at scaffolding, believe it or not, with my mm-hmm. friend. My friend's got a scaffolding company. And I went out with him because I just was trying to get, I was trying to find my way through it. Mm-hmm. I never wanted to be a scaffolder, but I just wanted to get out because I wasn't yeah. doing anything. Yeah. And um, 
I just had something inside me that said, Ryan, you need to figure your way out of this. And I knew I was a professional footballer, so my identity is being Ryan Stevenson, the footballer. I had went through my breakup um, and gone through a divorce where I was losing the kids full time. So these are two massive, massive parts of your life. Yeah. And they were just colliding at the one time and gone. And um, as I said to you, not seeing my kids every day just it just absolutely ruined me. Um, and the anxiety that I had, I, I, I'd be standing in the shop, that's, that's how bad it got, is I'd be standing in the shop and I could see some, now somebody might just look at me and think, oh, there's Ryan Stevenson. And I'd be thinking, wonder what he's talking about. Is he talking about me? What's he saying about me? Mm-hmm. Is he saying I'm rubbish at football? Mm-hmm. Is he saying I'm this? Is he saying I'm that? And it just, every single day, was just horrendous. It engulfs you, doesn't it? Aye. It was like the biggest, I used to go a run, which we were talking before we even done this. Um, Cause I just, I knew there was something inside me. The people go and say, you go and speak to somebody, go and speak to somebody, but there was just something inside me telling me, you need to find your way out of this. So it's going to go one way or the other for me. There was never a gray area of speaking to somebody for a prolonged amount of time that I was, you know, going to try and heal myself and all that. It just, that's just not me. So I knew, am I going to get my, find my way out here? Or I'm, no. Yeah. And I, um, I, We'd go a run round about the village that I stayed in, and you would come out the back of the village and go up this massive big hill. And I would run up the hill, and I remember running up it one day, and I was crying as I was running up it. And I knew in there that the, obviously it was a kind of wooded area where people would take their dogs, and I knew I'm looking at this big tree, and I'm like, that's where I'm going to do that. And I used to run by it every single day, and I'd be like, like right, I'm going to give myself three months. So I would be running up this hill, and it kind of. It, it was as if it kind of symbolised my life, as if like, I'm running up a hill just now and I need to try and get to the top. And if I get to the top, I'm going to be all right. And it was always just a struggle. I was like, that's three months. So I'll give myself three months. Something's got to happen in three months and see if it doesn't. I'm going to kill myself in there. And I'd planned it all that I thought, this is where I'll go because there'll not be kids going in there. So somebody's, you know, you always get that fear even thinking about it. Now, whether I would have done it or not, I don't know. But I, I'd thought, a kid's not going to go in there, so it'd be usually a guy that's walking his dog, and a guy could a guy could probably handle seeing that. Yeah. So that'll be all right. Yeah. And then it would, I would go in the next day, and I'd be like, I'm doing this. I mean, I, I've been on Google, Googling it. Like this, like, I think it's 11 minutes it'll take. So after two and a half minutes, roughly, you're going to be knocked out. And then after 11, 11 minutes, you're going to be dead. So it's 11 minutes of pain. But the pain I'm going through every single day just now, I'll do that. It's 11 minutes, then I'm done. And you're then trying to rationalise everyone. I'm like, my kids, would my kids be better without me here? Because what am I giving them right now? I can't even look after myself, never mind them. So do they need me here? And everything was just spiralling so far out of control. But I still, something inside me was saying, you need to find your, you need to find your way out of this. There is, there's something else here for you. And as I said to you before, like, fate, luck, certain wee things that I kept chipping away and I kept trying to chip away. I felt at times I was on my knees, but I just kept trying to fight and fight and fight. And um, luckily enough, things then started to fall into place for me. I've, I've managed to do um, do well setting up a company that's that I know I want to try and build for my kids. So that gives me a massive purpose in my life yeah. that I want to try and leave them, um, leave them some and leave my family something. So when I, when I, when I leave, I don't just die. You know, there's something, there's a legacy there that I can leave my kids and my kids' kids. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's kind of flipped on its head now where, you know, I've met Sarah, got a beautiful baby girl together. Um, when I first met her, and listen, credit where credit's due, when I met her, I was still very, very messed up. And um, she pulled me along. So behind every great man, there's a great woman. And she did certainly pull me along. Um at the time when I needed it most, when she could have walked away from me. Yeah. Um, she dragged me along and she's been, I started the company and listen, there's no, it's not as if like everyone was rosy in the garden. You start like, you know yourself when you try to start something, it's difficult, it's still difficult just now. She backs me a hundred percent and you are who you surround yourself with and I've managed to surround myself with um, the right people um, in my life. I now look at my life, I, I used to look back and think, I always wanted more. I always wanted, I had one car, I wanted an R car. Mm-hmm. I, I went to cruise, 
to buy a pair of trainers, I wanted two pairs of trainers in there. I always wanted more, and it was all rubbish. And now, I genuinely just, I'm above and beyond happy. Um, and I want nothing, all I want to try and do is help people. And I want to try and leave something for my kids. But it's a scary thought when you think back to running up a hill, having picked a tree that you're going to hang yourself off. Uh, aye, it sure is, mate. Um, and I, I've been there, yep. When I was suicidal, it's weird because people think it's just this thing, you're suicidal, you go hang yourself. I was thinking about this for days, for weeks, yeah. months, and it was the only thing I thought of every day, same thing, paranoia. Ran out of the supermarket with all my messages. I was out with my friends. I was so paranoid, it was freaking me out. Yeah. Then you start freaking yourself out thinking, is there something wrong with me, man? Yeah. What's going on? Why am I feeling like this? And then I'm thinking, no one... No one's really going to miss me. I'm not good enough for people. And you literally turn yourself into this drone yep. that just thinks... Who isn't you? Kill yourself. That's the thing. Kill yourself. Who is, yeah. who? And it's not you, but no. you're just... You're, you're clouded by all the... I was all, just all, the all the pain, the guilt. Yep. And, and you almost use the pain and the guilt to make yourself feel even worse. worse yep. and, and go into this spiral and... All credit to you, mate, for pulling yourself out of that, especially listen, not seeking help. Listen, it's, it's not just, it, but I think, I think um, by me not seeking help and finding a way through it, I think, as I said to you, I think everyone has fate and it's for a reason. And I've now got the chance to sit on your show and I'm lucky enough that you've invited me on that I can talk to you about it that might help one guy, might help one person that's sitting there thinking, and I genuinely believe that that's why all that happened. Yeah. Um, but it's a horrendous, horrendous thing. You know, I, I questioned, I questioned, did my mates like me? Why did he even, why did he even want to be friends with me? Mm-hmm. You know, just so much stuff goes through your head. Listen, to, you can have cars, you can have money, you can have houses, you can have all that stuff. It's all superficial, mate. You go to, the biggest thing you'll do is compete against yourself. Every single day, you know that yourself. All you do is compete against yourself. And I, I find now I run in my own lane. I do my own thing. Um, and I compete. I get, all I try to do is better myself every single day. I don't look at other people and think, I wish I had what they had. I wish I had this. I wish I had that. We all like nice things and we all want to aspire to do nice things. But I do my own thing now where I'm only trying to better myself. And I'm only trying to better myself for my family yeah. and my kids. We are our own biggest enemy, aren't we? Hundred percent. The, the person we need to be nicest and kindest to is ourselves first. The person you fight yourself, yeah. that's who you fight every day. But a shell. There's a guy that I've been talking to recently and he says he can't even look his cell in the mirror. Mm-hmm. He feels so disgraced about his cell. Um, he's been made redundant and a few other bad things have, have went on. And I was like... It's the same just now, mate. I'm, a, I'm, a same. I'm, in, a, I'm in the process of starting a, a charity up with my father-in-law. To right. help the homeless, my father-in-law does a lot um, delivering meals to homeless people around about Glasgow, and uh, it's something that I've I've thought about doing for a while. So we're in the process of, of doing that just now, um, and try to set up a, a sort of homeless community that we can, oh, yeah. um, in this side this side of Glasgow just now. now so it's a, a year away from happening, but I'm going to do everything I possibly can to help people, um, because people like that, yeah, you, you know, feeling like that day in day out. We know how it feels to a certain extent. Yeah. Um, but listen, you're a strong man. I, I'm strong through the football. I've had to be strong. So we've got the building blocks here. A lot of these people don't. And it just crumbles them. It just, there's no way out for them. There's no, they don't have any tools. They don't know of any, they don't have any, um, any things in place to help them. Um, and it's only right. And I said, as I said to you, it's, I think it's totally fake why you do this is because you're strong enough to admit what you've went through, mm-hmm. but you're strong enough to be- to beat it. Yeah. Um, and you'd be doing yourself an injustice, and you'd be doing the world an injustice if you didn't try and help people. To not to not share it. If I mean, talking about the day, I've had to stop this about four times now. Exactly. Because my anxiety is so bad. But you still get through um, it. And I'm struggling today big time. Didn't sleep last night. Shaking, sitting down. The living, I'm just sitting down in the kitchen, just just had a lot of self doubt in myself. Yeah. Um, and I'm sitting and I'm and I'm thinking about. The boy's future and, and am I doing enough? Am I providing enough? And I was really beating myself up last night. So to show up the day just shows how the strength I've got there, you know what I mean? 
But that's it though, mate. That's what you've got to think about is yeah. one you've showed up, one you've done it. And better than that, if somebody can watch this and you might help somebody. I think we'll help much more than one person. You know what I mean? I'm telling you, I think we'll help loads with this. Um, <coughs> so, what's next for Ryan Stevenson? Um, building the company. You know, my, I, I, um, I work day in, day out just now to build um, the company that we've set up. Uh, to try and leave leave something to the kids um, and that's what I do I try and be happy every day which I am um, I wake up with a smile on my face I think more than more than um, more than anything else that's that's the biggest thing is just to be happy I think um, if you can be happy in life and be grateful then everything else will fall into place you know I, I think if you have happiness you're grateful and you work hard you're you're, you're at some stage you find yourself getting luckier and luckier and it's all down to because one you are happy two you are grateful and three you are working hard so um that's what i'll do i do that every single day and um we both know like life can throw you twists and turns but um i'll just be happy mate try and be as happy as i possibly can i think um you touched back on legacy and we were before this we were talking about legacy and i think a man, when we get to about 30 and over 30, we just think it's all about what we leave to the kids now. It's all all about that. But I think it's important as well to enjoy every day, to look after ourselves, to give ourselves. Because sometimes that yeah. can become then an addiction in itself, can it? And well, we don't live a life I used to, to um, provide for the kids. I used to look at it and I used to think, see when I get to here. So I'm here just now. See when I get to here, I'm going to be happy. Mm-hmm. You never get here, mate. Getting to here is when you die. Yeah. What you need, what you need <laughs> yep. to enjoy as you're here right now, let's enjoy trying to get to here mm-hmm. and let's enjoy every day getting to here yep. because you can never go, or you're very, very lucky if you go from here to here. You have to take hundreds of massive wee steps yep. every single day, just chipping away, chipping away, but enjoy bettering yourself, enjoy learning new things. And before you know it, you'll be, you'll be there. Um, so I, as I said, I, I don't, I don't ever look too far in front of myself. I know where the company where it can go. I am, I, as I said to you, I've got an amazing partner in Sarah. I've got amazing kids, um, and I'm lucky that I'm I'm here and I'm lucky that um, I'm in the situation I'm in. So I'm grateful for that. Um, and all I want to do moving forward is if I can help him to doing, um, doing what I do, um, and doing these sort of things, then I'll do them the day I die. Class Brov always says that there's no such thing as perfection, but the closest thing to perfection is excellence. So why don't we just strive for that all the time? Hundred percent. I um, I want to thank you for coming on, mate. You've been so open and honest with us. Pleasure. Um, which is is it's eye opening, you know, and I think it's going to give so many people hope. I think you're going to help thousands of people um, that watch this and download this. You're going to give them hope. Footballers who will come and watch this, I know there'll be footballers that will watch this. Um, and even people you might know who are struggling that have not told you and and hopefully it's time to open up it's time to appreciate that yes we're all we're men but there's no stigma attached to this shit where we can't open up we can't say how we feel we can't we can't reach out we can't get help you know Um, it's all right to feel low it's all right to have bad days but it's how we pick ourselves up and how we move forward Um, go to wrap this up for the for today guys stay tuned thanks guys thanks for tuning in